Glad that I can be here on this day and have the opportunity to open God's Word <clears throat> to you once again. Open God's Word to you for the last time as your pastor, as uh, we'll be uh, heading eastward uh, towards uh, Gerlitz and uh, into our time of uh, retirement there and relocation. Thank you for your care and uh, for the opportunity to, to serve you in this way. Our text for today is in Acts chapter 20, and so if you have a Bible, if you have a device, if you have the text memorized, whatever it is that you have, please orient yourself to Acts chapter 20, and uh, we can work together with this text. Uh, we'll be looking at the, the verses beginning in verse 17. We've been looking at the city of Ephesus over these last several weeks and considering how it is that the Apostle Paul came to the city of Ephesus uh, in Acts chapter uh, 18 and 19 and how he served there and how he taught there in the hall of Tyrannus for a period of years. And uh, he remained with them and many good things took place as the church was established in the city of Ephesus. And then Paul took his leave and went elsewhere and Paul returned uh, to, to meet with them, and Paul uh, wrote a letter to Timothy, whom he had left behind in Ephesus. And uh, we also spent time looking at John's writing in 1 John, as uh, John wrote a letter to the churches in the surrounding area from the city of Ephesus, where he was uh, staying. He had, he had fled there after the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. And, uh, and then last Lord's Day, we, we looked at the end of the church at Ephesus. That is to say, the, the final word to that church, which came from the Lord Jesus himself in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And uh, Jesus uh, talked about the positive points in the church, their, their works and their, their labor and their patient endurance, but he also put special emphasis on what was lacking, and that is that they had abandoned the love that they had at first, and he challenged them. Uh, he challenged them to remember the heights from which they had fallen to repent and then do those deeds that were of first priority and first importance. And at the end of that, uh, the Lord Jesus did give an ultimatum or a threat which said that, uh, hey, if you, if you don't straighten up, um, I'm going to come and remove the lampstand from your place. And we know from uh, history, church history, the history of Asia Minor, Turkey, that the city of Ephesus uh, lost its gospel witness that there was not a, a vital church there for a long, long time. And that, uh, that's the, the truth uh, concerning many places in Asia Minor. But uh, God be praised that there are churches there in that area today and that there is mission work going on. And uh, even in the city of Ephesus, there are places where uh, the gospel can be heard, and we're grateful for that. And so last week we were in about A.D. 95 or so whenever John received his revelation and sent that to the churches. We're going to back up now this week to Acts chapter 20, which is about 30 years earlier, about A.D. 57. And uh, Paul has been traveling around and he has come to uh, Miletus, which is 30 miles south of uh, Ephesus, or if you're like kilometers, it's about 50 kilometers south of Ephesus. And he has sent uh, from there to call the Ephesian elders to come. Um, and he's asked them to come and meet with him there. And keep in mind, Paul was not uh, a contemporary individual. Uh, in AD 57, uh, sending a message to the elders in Ephesus would have been a major event, would have required a courier to carry that message and go to Ephesus and then return with the aforementioned elders to meet with Paul there. And so this took some time for this to happen, but they did come. And in Acts chapter 20, verse 17, this is what uh, Dr. Luke records in the book of the Acts of the Apostle. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. 
repeating Paul's words at the beginning, you yourselves know how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, as he calls the elders to come, he addresses them and he reminds them of what happened in the past during that time when he was physically resident and present and teaching and ministering in the city of Ephesus. He reminds them of his way of life, how it is that he lived before them. He was serving the Lord. And notice the words that he uses to describe that with humility. It's a strange thing sometimes for us to think, well, I am a humble man. You know how humble I am. And you know I cried a lot, yeah, and there was a lot of trouble. Now, Paul is not boasting in this. Paul is just affirming what they already know. This phrase that he uses, you yourselves know, is something that we read multiple times in Paul's letters. You know, he says to the Thessalonians, what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. They know the testimony of his life and he's reminding them of his humility, his tears, his trials, the opposition, and how in the midst of all that he says, you yourselves know how I did not shrink did not step back, did not get small and unnoticeable, but with boldness, Paul opened the word of God and taught them and declared to them anything that was profitable, anything that would help them in their spiritual life and journey, anything that would disciple them and train them in righteousness. Paul was teaching them. He didn't shrink, verse 20, from teaching them publicly or privately. He took the opportunity to open the Word of God and to declare the things concerning Christ continually. If you drop down to verse 27, he uses that phrase again, I did not shrink. I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. That is to say, Paul didn't go to his favorite text, the happy text, the precious promises. Paul also opened the text to the terrible threats of Jesus. Paul opened the text to the law and to grace. And Paul explained what it is that God requires and how God had satisfied his own requirements by sending his son as a substitute and sacrifice for our sins. Paul says, I, I didn't shrink back from that. I didn't pick verses that would be good for you to hear, to tickle your ears, things that would make you happy, or, or things that would avoid offense, because Paul says, woe is me in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Preaching the gospel, proclaiming the grace of God was the call upon the apostle Paul's life, and he didn't shrink back from that. The gospel is itself offensive to human pride, and to human performance. And if you've never run into that offense of the gospel, if the gospel has never offended you in terms of your pride and performance, then I want to consider that with you just for a moment. Because your performance is awful. And there's nothing to be proud of. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah, I mean, that's just the reality of it. I cannot do anything, even as a professional holy man, I cannot do anything that will earn me a gram of approval from a holy, righteous, eternal God. But he's given that to me by grace. He's given that to you by grace through faith. And that's what Paul says in verse 21. He says, I was testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember this. Repentance is a gift from God to us. Faith is a gift from God to us. We don't have to work up crocodile tears to impress God with how sorry we are about our sin, nor do we have to work up that kind of sense of, okay, now I really, 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 really do believe Nothing's happened yet. It's, faith is a gift. Repentance is a gift that God graciously gives to undeserving, sinful men, women, boys, and girls. And Paul says, that's what I was all about. He's talked about his past. You know. But then in verse 22, he goes on. And now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Holy Spirit not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me that in every city, imprisonment and afflictions await me. Wow, what a promise from the Holy Spirit of God. <laughs> what, yeah, 
And, and we, we have endured so little in the arena of affliction, so little in the arena of opposition, that we read this and we, we're shocked by it. But Paul says, I know this. I know this because of what the Spirit of God has related to me. The Spirit of God has constrained him, has compelled him, has bound him, and is warning him and testifying to him of what awaits. And Paul says, verse 24, but I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course. And the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus, and there's that word again, to testify to bear witness to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says, I'm going to finish the course. I want to complete what God has given to me to do. Remember what he said in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Do you believe that? Paul believes that. He says, I don't consider my life of any value to myself, that's, it's not of any importance. It's not precious to me because if I die, I gain Christ and Christ is all. You see, Paul wants to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He's taught them. He's declared to them the whole counsel of God. And he did that without any of the benefits that we would ascribe to the internet age, um, even considering the, the call to the elders, as we have earlier. Come. He didn't send them a group text. He, he sent a messenger. He didn't even send, a, you know, Deutsche Post. He sent a messenger with a letter in hand calling for them to come. And they came. Can you imagine that? Elders 30 miles away, how, how long would that take for the elders of Ephesus to make their way to Miletus? Days. To be able to get there and to meet with the Apostle Paul who had instructed them. He says this in verse 26, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Paul's not declaring his overall universal comprehensive innocence. Paul is the chief of sinners. Keep that in mind. But Paul, in this specific context, just as he said in chapter 18 and verse 6, when he confronted people and they were resistant, he had proclaimed the word of God, the whole counsel of God, and he declares to them then, your blood be upon your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And so Paul is saying, I have fulfilled my ministry. I have warned you of the wrath to come. I have told you of the grace of Christ. I've given you every opportunity to receive the good gifts of God and repentance and faith, and you have stubbornly refused. I know that I am innocent in this. And then Paul speaks directly to the elders of Ephesus, beginning in verse 28, and he charges them. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. His first command is this, keep watch, pay close attention. And what's the first area of close attention? To yourselves. So elders, to Mark and David and Philip, I say, Pay close attention to yourselves, individually and corporately, and to the flock of God, in which the Holy Spirit have made you overseers. Notice who makes overseers. Overseers is just another word for elders, another word for pastors. But the Holy Spirit is the one who has made overseers in the church. It's not by a vote of 70% of the AFAL. It's by the Holy Spirit's work using the people of the church to affirm what the Spirit is doing. He says, pay close attention. And then the next command says, therefore, because of this, he says, I want you to care for. It's a, it's a word that is derived from the noun of a, of a shepherd. It is to shepherd the flock, care for the flock. What's the work of a shepherd? 
Put yourself out on the, the, the hills surrounding the countryside and you see a, a shepherd with his sheep. The responsibilities of a shepherd are legendary and simple. Feed and lead and warn. That's what shepherds do. And so shepherds in the context of a local church are to feed the flock of God, to provide nourishment and instruction for the people of God. They are to lead them, to lead in a direction that is pleasing to God, that gives glory to God, and they are to warn of danger from within and danger from without. And that's what he says when he goes on. He says, I know in the very next verse that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in. I know that's going to happen. And, and because the, the church of Jesus Christ is the church that belongs to God, which he purchased or obtained with his own blood. By the sacrifice of the Son of God, he secured for himself a people of his own possession to be zealous for good deeds, as Paul writes to Titus. He says, this is what I want you to know. This is why this is so important. You can't take a haphazard, lackadaisical, hit and miss approach to caring for the whole flock of God. It has to be intentional. It has to be consistent. It has to be scriptural. It has to be careful and personal. It has to be loving. It has to be hard sometimes because the dangers are real. The dangers to the souls of men and women are desperately real. I know after my departure that fierce or savage wolves will come in. Wow. He's leaving. He's leaving them on their own. But he's not abandoning them. He's instructing them. He's warning them. He's preparing them. He says, I know after I go, savage, fierce wolves will come. Now, he's not talking about the kind of breakthrough that we see sometimes in Germany where the, a wolf has been sighted for the first time in 15 years in a certain Landkreis. No, he's talking about that kind of opposition and violence and destructive force that can come against the church of Jesus Christ. The local church is always in a place of vulnerability from attacks from without, Others can come in. And in my 22 plus years here, I've seen people come in bringing destructive heresies. I've seen people come in and try to draw people away. I've seen people come in promoting and distributing items that are destructive to the gospel. And I've seen elders and deacons and small group leaders and Sunday school teachers and regular members and attenders say, no, stop. That's what we must do. We must guard the gate for the church of Jesus Christ, the flock of God. And fierce and savage wolves is that figure of speech again, figure of speech which is describing that destructive power that wants to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. Now that can, excuse me, that can come in many different ways. Sometimes it comes in the form of aggressive hostility where you have an angry atheist who comes in or an angry cult promoter who comes in and wants to pull something in a certain direction, someone who wants to grab the wheel of the local church and steer it in a way of, oh, different from what God would require. He says, no, don't do that. Resist that kind of aggressive hostility. But there's also, in tandem with the aggressive hostility, there's also at times a do-nothing passivity which is to say, you see something happen, you say, oh, okay, it happened. Let's go on. That is just as destructive to an individual personal life, a family life, a church life, is to have a do-nothing passivity about that. Be on guard. Keep watch over yourselves. Pay careful attention to the flock which God has entrusted to you. That's his word to the elders. Not only are there threats from without, but he also goes on to describe in verse 30, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Wow. That's a scary verse. I don't, I don't need to tell you how scary that is. 
That is to say, Paul is addressing the elders of the church at Ephesus, men whom he has trained, he has discipled, he has loved them and led them, and they have served the Lord well. And Paul says, be on your guard. Not from without coming in, but from within you, from among you as a group. Men from among your own selves. Men speaking twisted things. Men who are caught in their own web of deceit and personality-driven ministry that they will want to draw disciples after themselves. Paul says, be on your guard. Be on your guard. This is what Paul himself experienced as we spent one Sunday in here looking at that strange verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 32, where Paul says, I fought with beasts at Ephesus. Paul didn't get into the gladiatorial ring and wrestle with lions or elephants or hippopotami. He didn't do any of that. But Paul fought with beasts at Ephesus. He fought with those who resisted the gospel, and he fought back because he loved the church of God, because he loved the gospel of God, because he loved the grace of God. Paul must do just that. You know, I look back on years of ministry. I have fought with beasts I fought with beasts in Texas. I have fought with beasts in Tennessee. I have fought with beasts in South Carolina. And I have fought with beasts here in Munich. And I expect I will eventually fight with beasts somewhere along the way in Gerlitz. God has his way of doing that. Because when you take a stand for the goodness of the gospel, there's always going to be a growl of resistance that says this cannot stand. And yet it must stand Because it's the truth of God's word. I have have stood and engaged with legalists and with moralists and with plagiarists and with pessimists and with feminists, all kinds of ists. I've engaged with as those who resist the grace of God. I have engaged with aggressive bean counters, pencil net geeks. I have engaged with nitpickers and word twisters and perversions of sexuality and doctrine and procedure. I have engaged with that in Philip and Mark and David. You will engage with that as well, as well as anyone else. That's life in the 21st century. Increasing waves of hostility and intensity of opposition to the goodness and the beauty of God's truth. I plead with you, stand firm. And there are some who have opposed me. And those who have opposed me, I would say this. And to those who will oppose you, I would say this. Good advice. Keep a bottle of wine of forgiveness ready at your table. Do you know what I mean by that? That means when someone who has opposed you, someone who has wronged you, someone who has sinned against you, comes to you and says, hey, I did something wrong. Will you forgive me? Pop that cork. Don't make them grovel. Don't make them identify the 21 ways in which they've sinned against you. Pop the cork and drink a wine. Remember what Jesus said? This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which was shed for the forgiveness of sins. Keep that bottle of wine of forgiveness at the ready. I'll tell you a story. In 1999, I was fired. That's a bad word, isn't it? Must be something wrong with this man to make him be fired. Yeah, that was because I stood up and and declared that plagiarism in the pulpit is wrong. That's because I said deceiving people about what the Bible says is wrong. And uh, people in that church uh, where I was serving as a school administrator, uh, they wanted to protect the one who was plagiarizing and promoting false teaching. And they did. And 21 years later, In January of 2020, when I was in South Carolina, a couple that was in that church, the husband of that couple was one of the deacons in that Baptist church, and the wife was on the school board at that Baptist church. They came up to me at a conference that Grace Church was putting on and said, Steve, we need to talk to you and Robin. And after 21 years, they said, Steve, we sinned against you. 
We sinned against your family. Our whole church did. Will you forgive us? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And we hugged and we had breakfast together and we shared memories and joys. And that was a marvelous experience. And I hope that you can have that experience someday too. Because I know I'm looking at a sea of people who have been sinned against. And I want you to have that bottle on your table so when the knock comes on your door, you're ready to serve up wine of forgiveness and not the gall of bitterness. Keep alert. That's what Paul says. Verse 32 is where I want to spend the rest of our time here today. Verse 32 is a marvelous verse because it reminds us of who is sovereign, who is in charge, who's responsible. Paul says in verse 32, Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. What else can Paul do? What else can a pastor do? I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. I commit you to God. He is faithful. He is powerful. He is loving. He will build his church. He will complete the good work that he has begun in MICC in 1985. I commit you to God. This word commit is used in the scriptures. Jesus in, in Luke's gospel, in Luke 23, Luke uses it to describe Jesus where he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit from the cross. Paul uses the word in 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, the things that you've heard from me in the, in the presence of others, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Entrust, commit, commend. There's no other place to go. No one else has the words of eternal life. I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. Let's play the genitive game one last time. The word of his grace? What's that? Huh. Is that talking about like his grace, like you would say to a king? The word of his grace. No, 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 no. It's the word that comes from his grace, comes to us by grace. It conveys his grace to us. It tells us of his grace. I commit you to God and to the word that is comprehensively gracious. I bring that to you, and I encourage you, saints, take good advantage of the ordinary means of grace, reading, studying, meditating, memorizing the precious, eternal, valuable, true word of God. Do that. Don't neglect that. He says, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up able to build you up. Get a little workout going. I need to get bulked up here. Spiritually, you do. Spiritually, you do. The Word of God is the only thing that is able to nourish you, to instruct you, to encourage you, to inform you, to transform you, to instruct you, to train you. Nothing else in the world can do that. We read from Psalm 19 at the beginning of the service this day. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Does your soul need reviving? You bet it does. Every day, go to the word. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Any fools in the room? Yeah. Anyone want to be wise in the room? Yeah. Go to the word. It brings wisdom. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Is your heart sorrowful? Are you grieving? Do you wonder if there's some reliability that you're missing? Go to the Word. Refresh your mind on the promises and let God rejoice in your heart so that you take pleasure in what He has promised and what He's committed to do. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Those of you who wear glasses know what it's like not to have your eyes enlightened. And when you put them on, you say, ah, wow. And that's what God's word can do. It helps us to have clarity and precision in our vision. 
The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Do not turn away from this word which is able to build you up and to grant you the inheritance among those who have been sanctified. See, God grants inheritance. Inheritance is not something that you gain because you've earned it. Inheritance is something that comes to you by divine fiat, not an Italian car, but by a declaration that this is yours in Christ. Your inheritance is sure because you are, you are in Christ. Do not forsake the word of his grace. Don't forsake it for your sake. Don't forsake it for my sake. And do not forsake it for the sake of his name. That's my charge to you all. Elders, members, attenders, first-time visitors. Hear, heed, follow the word of God which is able to save your souls. I'm just going to take a few minutes to conclude with some reflections for myself here. Moving into retirement is something new. Moving to Gerlitz is going to be something new. I understand and have discovered that they do have vice force and labor case there. This is, <laughs> this is good, okay? Um, since 1999, I've served as your pastor. Um, that's a long time. Um, I remember Dennis coming out to the airport to pick up us and our kids in various shifts as we arrived. And Dennis always was very eager to entertain us with the, the town of Ausfart that was coming up next. And uh, yeah, 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 Dennis. Is it too late now to have a happy childhood, Dennis? No, never, never too late. Okay. So I've served here for 22 plus years. And I, I got out my little calculator today and I thought of it and I figured it out. 22 years and six months divided by 66, 67 years and six months. Again, approximations on both. That is exactly one-third of my life. One-third of my life I've invested in Munich and the people of this church, and I've seen thousands and thousands of people come through here, and I'm grateful for that. In that process, I have baptized many, I have evangelized many. I've taught and discipled. I've dedicated children. I've officiated weddings and conducted funerals. And now, as Paul says, the time of my departure has come. And so this is my final word to you, my final sermon to you as your pastor. I've, uh, as I calculate, I'm sure it's over 1,000 times that I've stood at this pulpit in this building and proclaimed to you, the unchanging, inerrant, infallible word of God. The whole counsel of God. You sat with me through Leviticus. You sat with me through 1 Corinthians and Song of Solomon and Ruth and Jonah and Romans. You sat with me through a lot, and we've gone through a lot together. You, you've endured, Dennis and Jane have endured an annual checkup every year for the last 23 years. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege of leading you, of serving you, of teaching you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for learning. Thank you for asking good questions. Thank you for following, for loving, admonishing, praying, and, and thank you for reading. That's a strange thing to say, but I've heard from several of you uh, in recent weeks how much you have benefited from the various booklets and pamphlets that were distributed. Probably 16,000 reams of paper. Many forests of trees have been destroyed. Um, but you've enjoyed it, and so have I. Um, I, have, I found in 23 years here that this is the case, uh, overgeneralization. There are people who read those, and there are people who don't. And there are people who follow along with where we're going as a church, and there are people who offer opposition. I found that so many times that there's been a resistance to the teaching of the Word of God. I know that you don't have time to read a 300-page book, 
But if I can give you a chapter, if I can give you a summary, if I can give you something that points you in that direction, you can read that on the S-Bahn. You can conveniently forget about it on your seat and somebody else might pick it up, curious about the English language and the things of God and read it. Thank you for doing that. You know, I've completed my ministry here. A verse came across my reading recently, John 10, 41. Fascinating description of John the Baptist. It said, John did no miraculous signs. And I can affirm to you, Steve has done no miraculous signs. But, John records, but everything that he said about this man, Jesus, was true. And I pray that everything that I've said to you about this man, this God, Jesus, is true. That's my desire. Leaving is hard for us. Leaving is hard for you. And I know that some are not grieving, and that's always been the case. Always been the case. There's always some within a congregation who say, I can't wait to see you in my rearview mirror. I can't wait to see you climbing the stairs to get on a plane at uh, Munich International Airport. I can't wait. That's always the case. But we pray for restoration in the gospel as always. Do pray for us. Do pray for your elders. Pray for your new pastor. Treat him well. Honor God. Treat his family well. Give him the gift of joy. Hebrews 13 describes how it is that there are people in the church who elders are accountable to God for your souls. He says, let them do this with joy. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning because that would be of no benefit to you. Don't do that. I've completed my ministry, yet I remain a sinful man, yet a man who trusts God, a man who loves God, a man who is joined in union with Christ, a man who walks by the Spirit of God, a man who battles sin in the flesh, the man who grieves the losses of connection and friends and family over the years, and a man who rejoices in the abundant evidences of the grace of God that I see all around me. And so I thank you for that. Let's bow together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have spoken, you have not stuttered. You have spoken with clarity and with authority and, and we would be foolish to resist you and yet we confess that we do. We think that we have wisdom in ourselves. We think that we have insights that you do not. We think that you are late when you are really on time. We think that this evil will never pass, but you know that it will. That you're the one who works together all things for good, for those who love you and are called according to his purpose. You are the one who worked things together for good in Joseph's life, as, even as people around him in his own family meant it for evil, but you meant it for good, for the deliverance of many people. And so we trust you this day. I entrust this church to you, the people in it, the leadership, the future of the church, that you will complete a good work in Christ. I thank you for what you have done over many years, and I pray that you would be magnified greatly in this body. For Jesus' sake, amen. As you know, we are, as a church, guests at uh, the FA game, and um, we couldn't think of um, a better show of um, support than to have Pastor Matthias Lohmann of the FAG to, to share a few words as he and Steve have been working together for a number of years. And I just want you to know there's, um, there's such a camaraderie um, between um, the FAG and, and MICC. And it's something that um, in my conversations with Matthias, um, it's, it's always been this expressed desire that there's two strong churches that work together in the kingdom. And the two of them have worked together faithfully. 
uh, for a number of years and uh, doing their part in both of their churches. And it's uh, my distinct honor and just privilege to just ask Matthias um, to share a few words um, as, um, as Steve is retiring. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Philip. Yes, yeah, Steve, we first talked before I even arrived in Munich. Uh, you do remember that, I trust. Um, I was on a drive from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore, Maryland, the German in America and the American in German, Germany, and we talked. And after about two minutes into the conversation, we realized, oh, that's the church where I will be soon. So in September 90, uh, 2008, I arrived here. Uh, you had been serving here faithfully for nine years already. And it was such a joy to come here and to know there's an older brother in the, in the Lord, a pastor with much experience, and a pastor's wife with a lot of experience, and to be able to, to partner with you in the gospel. And I've, I've really seen that as a partnering. And I spoke to Sarah, who is not here today, but she sends her greetings. And we felt that you were, in a way, and both of you, Rob and I, I address you personally too, that you both were spiritual mentors to us in some ways in pastoral ministry. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. You have modeled what it means to be a faithful pastor, a faithful family, serving in a church for many years for the good of many. And um, we really desire to follow your footsteps. Um, I've been here just 13 and a half years and not even a third of my life, even though I'm younger. So I'll, I'll try to get there. And I wanted to thank, thank you very, very much for your ministry. Steve, thank you so much for many times when I was struggling and didn't really know what to do and I could call you and got some good words of advice. I found someone who prayed for me and with me. So thank you for doing that. Robin, thank you for pouring into Sarah. Uh, she told me to tell you in front of everyone here uh, that, that she's very, very grateful. So I want to end with words that you already started. I, I was afraid you would quote the whole thing. I'm glad you didn't. So you, you left me <laughs> something over here to, to say to you. Uh, words that the Apostle Paul uh, wrote to Timothy right at the end of his ministry. Uh, and I know your ministry is not ending. You are just transferring to another place. And I, I, I certainly expect that you will continue to serve the Lord as long as you have breath to do that. But, but so take these words not as final words, but as final words for here in the FEG, in the MICC. Um, so the Apostle Paul writes about himself, and I will turn this into a words addressing you. The time of your departure has come. You have fought the good fight. You have finished the race. You have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for you the crown of of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to you on that day, and not only to you, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And may you rejoice in this crown, and may you strive towards it for the rest of your days. Thank you very much for serving alongside the FEG. May the Lord bless you. Um, Marek, my fellow elder, the oldest elder right in the crew right now, um, would like to also say something on behalf of the elders, and then I have also an attack planned on you, so it's all good. As the longest serving elders, I want to publicly express my thanks to you, Steve. I thank you for the 20 plus years of preaching. Sunday in, Sunday out, of upholding God's word, of heralding the gospel. Paul says that scripture is able to make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus and is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, 
for correction and for training in righteousness. Your labor is not in vain. It has borne already and will still bear its effect. In these times where all kinds of truth are floating around, the faithfulness in exposing God's word to God's people cannot be overestimated. Likewise, I thank you, Robin, for faithfully upholding scripture in the Tuesday Bible study. Teaching women to soak in scripture is a very important task. So farewell. May God bless you in the time to come, and may you be a blessing to others as you go on. Thank you. So now, as the youngest spunt in the whole mix, um, um, Steve, you and I and Miss Robin, uh, we've had we've had many conversations. I remember uh, when I first moved to Munich, I was sitting right over there uh, with my mom, and Steve eyed me, and um, and he called me the next day. He said, "I saw you at church." I was like, "I bet you did." I'm my mother's son. And that's how it was known, really. Um, and um, he invited me for coffee. And he wanted to get to know me. And he said, Philip, I mean, this is Steve. This is how a shepherd operates to make sure to safeguard the flock. He said, first words, no joke, I don't trust you. <laughs> I was like, and you shouldn't. Um, because trust is earned. And as a shepherd of this flock, he has, um, over the years that I've gotten to know him, and Miss Robin and uh, Betsy, he has protected the flock. He's stewarded what God has entrusted to him. And so I was thinking about this transition piece, and um, I've mentioned to you what my desire for you is uh, a, few, a few months ago, many a months ago, actually. And um, I had this passage in mind, and... Um, so this week, I has, I've revisited that passage. It's out of Deuteronomy 31. And in Deuteronomy 31, there was a passing of the baton between Moses and Joshua. And see, this is where already the passage falls apart because we don't have a Joshua in place. So I get that. I realize that. So bear with me. But there is... Uh, there's this uh, speech that Moses gives, and this is where it falls apart again. So glory to me at this point strike two. So he says, I'm about to die. So that's not what we wish for you. So, <laughs> but he starts off by saying, I'm about to die. I'm 120 years old. So you got a few more to go on that one. But in a way, Moses announces his final retirement because God and him had already conversed about what God will do with him. And so he gets to see the land one more time. And then God takes care of that. But in the meantime, there is something that um, Moses does with Joshua. And this is certainly that what I really wanted to communicate even today for the church, for you, and for those that are watching online. He will no longer serve, Moses that is, as their familiar, trusted leader. And that evokes a certain set of emotions. There's uncertainty, insecurity. There is um, doubt. There is many questions. And I'm certain that you have those questions, and they're absolutely right to have. So voice those questions in the f days to come. But there's a lot of responses that would have come up. So Moses immediately in this passage reminds them of what they need to hold on. Pastor Steve reminded us as a church, stay faithful to the word of God. That's our responsibility. As elders, we've been charged. That is also our responsibility. But here's the promises that God makes to Joshua and the people. And he says, God will go before you. It's the same God. God will bring about victory. He is the one that brings about victory. God will fulfill his promises to them. He will go with them. 
while your ministry and the capacity of pastor has come to an end, the ministry of the church has not. We are still to make disciples of the nations. We're to baptize them and teach them all that Christ has commanded us to obey. And then the promise, God will not leave them and forsake them. And then he summoned Joshua, he laid on his hands, and for everybody to see, he basically said, this is now your new leader. And again, that is not what we have in place in terms of having one pastor at this point, but you're not without leadership. And that's good news too. And also with that, um, there's a process that then has to unfold. God and Joshua have to appear at the tent of meeting, and it is only then when God puts his seal of approval on them that that process is complete. That is still something that our church is engaged in, and I'm excited in the days ahead as we're looking for what God has for us. But at this point, I would be amiss uh, if I didn't just say thank you. Thank you for your friendship. And I'm glad. I've driven by Gurlitt so many times. I'm glad I now have a stopping point. They may have vice words than Leberkäse, but, you know, those Saxony folks, they do all kinds of perverted things with vice words. They might put ketchup on it. <laughs> so please teach them a better way. Um, there's also a lot of work to be done uh, in Gurlitz. Um, and I'm sure Miss Robin will be glad to see you work in ministry in Gurlitz so that you don't have to stare at each other constantly. <laughs> so with that, I just want to, to pray a blessing over you guys and, um, and just really ask God that he would bless you. You're going in and you're going out. And that the God that said, I'm going to go with my people, is going to be the same God that's going with you in this next season. So if I can ask you to stand as we pray, and then we have another time of response. Heavenly Father, I just want to ask for Steve and Robin. I just want to say thank you for their faithful service in this church. Father, those that come after this couple are standing on the uh, shoulders of giants. And um, as Pastor Loman has said, we wouldn't be here were it not for his faithfulness. And Robin's faithfulness to teach women to be a mentor mom for their friendship, for their investment, for their protection. And Father, I just want to ask as they um, transition into this new season in their lives, Father, that you would bless them. Father, would, the, would you bless them with sweet memories of what's behind them? And Father, would you increase the opportunities for ministry, for discipleship, for mentoring? Father, I'm glad that I have somebody I can call and ask questions because he's more advanced not only in years but also in ministry and experience. Father, thank you so much for... Um, these opportunities, and I want to ask that you would help him be that Barnabas, be that Paul to somebody else in Gurlitz. And Father, would you make a tangible investment in that area and beyond through them moving there? I want to ask for your protection among them, Father, for their marriage, for that you would bless them and uh, reunite them even further in a new and fresh way in this season. And Father, would you help them navigate some of the touch points along the way? And so I want to ask for your grace and mercy to go before them and that you would also be their rear guard. And Father, we thank you for what you've allowed us to be a part of in their lives. In your son's precious name, amen. We have a flower for you. I figured it would be better not to have cut flowers and seeing that you have been Germanized, um, it's a fascinating thing. Germans like to travel with potted plants. So go ye to Gerlitz with your potted plant. And for those of you who would still wish to uh, sign the book 
uh, for Pastor Steve. You have an opportunity after this service um, for coffee. It's downstairs. We're going to have some people outside so we don't have to dart out and rush out. Okay? So make use of the time. Hug them and, um, and um, make sure you get your plant. So you got to be that awkward one on the Autobahn. Okay? Let's hear our benediction. Church, keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. Give honor to your marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So do not be attracted by strange new ideas. Your strength comes from God's grace, not from rules about food which don't help those who follow them. Amen. Go in peace.